Good evening. My name is Kathy Miller, and I am the Director of Supports and Service at the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for tonight's webinar, Your Child's Rights, Learn the Laws and Rules to Support Your Child's Education. Tonight we are so pleased that Maura McElerney, Senior Staff Attorney from the Education Law Center, will be presenting this informative webinar for you all. Let me tell you a little bit about our project. Competence and Confidence, Partners in Policymaking, Family Leadership is brought to you by the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University, and funding for this project comes from the Pennsylvania Developmental Disabilities Council. Our project, C2P2 Family Leadership in Inclusive Education for Non-Traditional Schools, is designed for families of students with disabilities who are educated in home schools, cyber charter schools, charter schools, private schools, and parochial schools. The goal of this project is to create a network of family leaders who will work together with educators and administrators to champion inclusive practices for children with disabilities in the non-traditional school community. Project Activities include online leadership development training, such as tonight's webinar, and free one-on-one -on -one parent consultation, which offers supports from trained parent consultants, as well as online resources. Tonight's webinar, Your Child's Rights, Learn the Laws and Rules to Support Your Child's Education, is presented by Maura McElerney, who you will hear shortly, and Maura will tell us all more about the Education Law Center, where she is a senior staff attorney. I want to make a note about our future webinar, which is occurring on March 19th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. as well, the Parent Professional Relationship Teamwork for Success. We know that when families and educators join together as collaborators, all things are possible. Please come to this webinar and learn strategies and proven methods to build effective teams as family members working together with educators and administrators to support diverse learners. We also have some archived webinars which you can find on our website. Tim Grusel um, was our guest speaker for Creating a Vision for Your Child's Future. Again, Tim does an excellent job of really helping you set the vision for your child and really use this as a guidepost to meet your child's goals and objectives as he or she goes through the education system and grows and develops. It's an excellent system. Tim uh, and session that Tim has put together for us, he's been a speaker for uh, us for many years and he really uh, does a wonderful job in helping you identify benchmarks and um, really set those goals and objectives for your child's future so that your child's future is one that uh, you are, are wanting for, for him or her. Uh, the, some of our parent consultants from Pennsylvania's Education for All Coalition, Diane Perry, Karen Solomon, and Natalie Wieters uh, put together for us a, a, a session on inclusion, supporting all abilities of students learning together. And again, these are parent professionals who have children with disabilities and really share wonderful stories and strategies on how to work together collaboratively with your school and really create a life that is full and meaningful for your child, both in and out of school. To access the archived webinars, please go to our website page, which is referenced here. Another wonderful support that we're able to offer through this project is free one-on-one -on -one parent consultation. Families participating in C2P2 family leadership training requesting guidance and technical assistance will be matched with parent consultants from Pennsylvania's Education for All Coalition, PEAK, one of our, our main collaborators on this project. This one-on-one -on -one parent consultation 
can assist you with the following areas. The uh, trained parent consultants can help you locate resources and supports for your child, will help you understand your child's rights, will help you review your child's individual education plan and or his or her evaluation report. They will offer you strategies to support your child's inclusive education, making suggestions and ideas for accommodations and supports for your child's specific needs. They can also attend an in, uh, a IEP meeting with you and your child and assist you in tran transition times, you know, those times when you're going from early intervention to the start of school or when your child is transitioning out of secondary school. It's a very valuable resource and we're so pleased that we're able to offer to this, you, to this service to you free of cost. Support can be offered in person, over the phone, or through email, whatever is needed. To request a parent consultant, again, you simply need to go to our project website, which is listed here, and complete a form. Once that form is completed, a family member will get back to you. Um, actually, Kathy Rachiamaya, who is our project coordinator, and she'll get back to you and will be able to um, set you up with a parent consultant from PEAK. When you go to our website, you'll also see that we have listed a number of links to some very valuable resources that people have asked us for and which we think are particularly valuable to families who have children um, being educated in non-traditional settings. In addition to this resource that we have on our website, we also created the C2P2 Family Leadership Facebook, which is a closed group, which means that you just simply um, need to make a request to join the group. Once you make that request by going to this Facebook um, page that's referenced here, your request will be accepted within a few days and you can post and read comments. Posting is sort of like the chat box that we have available to you this evening where I see that some people are already chatting and asking questions. I do want you to know that what some of the answers and some of the, um, the, the conversation that's happening on the chat box is uh, not sanctioned by the Institute on Disabilities. You may, we can't, um, since you are chatting and people are answering, we can't verify that all the information that you're getting is valid, but we do um, want, you know, want you to know that on Facebook we will be able to do that for you. So, more, for more information about C2P2 Family Leadership, uh, Kathy Rachia Meyer is our Family Education Coordinator and she's the coordinator of this project. And you'll see on this slide that you have all of Kathy's information. So uh, please feel free to get in touch with Kathy if you should have any additional questions about tonight's program or about the project in general. That would be great. So some housekeeping issues. Again, I refer to that chat box on the lower right portion of your screen. And when you have a question, just if you would please type your question in the chat box. Um, we will try to get as many questions as we can answered this evening. Um, I want you to know that all questions will be, uh, will be confidential and will not be recorded. Um, but of course, people on the website will hear them. But um, other than that, they will not be available uh, and recorded on our archived webinars. It is very important, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, that this uh, project is funded by the Pennsylvania Developmental Disabilities Council and we would really like to give them some good feedback from you as to what you think of this particular webinar and the project. We also really value your opinion and would love to hear from you as to other subjects you would like to hear from, how we can do things to accommodate you more. So please take five, ten minutes to go to this particular SurveyMonkey website and to fill out uh, the survey so that we can best serve you. That would be great. Thank you so much. I also want to let you know that everyone who is attending tonight's webinar will also be getting a follow-up email from our C2P2FL 
um, email, and we will be giving you these links again. So, um, so you will have a copy of the PowerPoint. You'll also have a copy of our rules and regulations chart, as well as these links. And please do take the time to fill out our survey. I really appreciate that. So I would like to turn the program over now to Maura McElerney, who's going to give you lots of great information on your child's rights. Thank you so much, Maura. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Kathy. Really, really appreciate it. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be presenting tonight and appreciate your time on the phone this evening. I wanted to mention that I am from the Education Law Center. In case folks on the phone don't know who we are, we are a statewide legal advocacy organization. We advocate on behalf of educationally at-risk children. So that includes uh, children of poverty, children who are English language learners, children who may be experiencing homelessness or in the foster care system and the juvenile justice system. And in particular, we have a very long history of advocating on behalf of children with disabilities. Um, I'm very excited uh, that this evening's uh, session is devoted to focusing on the rights of children who are in non-traditional settings. So tonight, as an overview, we're going to be talking about children uh, with disabilities or suspected of having disabilities who uh, may be homeschooled or have been placed in a charter school, a cyber charter, a parochial, or a private school, um, but that's placed by parents, not placed by a school district. And we'll talk a little bit about what that distinction means as we go along. I've segmented this in uh, three ways. So first, we're going to talk about uh, children in charter schools and cyber charter schools. And then we're going to move on to the other categories. So um, it, the way that I've framed it here is to really consider specific issues that are, are uh, particularly relevant. So we're going to talk about admissions and enrollment regulations and laws that apply to children in these various contexts. We're going to talk about the right to request an initial evaluation and the content of that evaluation and reevaluation. We're going to talk about the right to a free, appropriate public education and what that means in the disability context under the IDEA. We'll also be discussing the types of services that you're entitled to, whether you're in a charter school or whether you're in a uh, private parochial school or whether you're homeschool. And that varies according to services that are, uh, that are provided and available. But we're going to put this in a context of what are, your edu what are the educational rights of your children. So that's important. We're going to also talk about the right to inclusion in these various settings, as well as protections in the school discipline context and the right to transportation. And then in each, with respect to each one of these uh, non-traditional settings, we'll also talk about what the dispute resolution process is um, in, in these various schools. So we're going to start talking about charter and cyber charter schools. And if you remember nothing else, but I'm sure you remember a lot from this uh, presentation, a charter school is an independent public school. So it is a public school established and operated under a charter from a local school board. So this is particularly important with respect to the educational rights of children with disabilities because the IDEA applies with equal force with respect to legal entitlements when you are in a charter school, including a cyber charter school. So it operates as a public school. There are some distinctions between Chapter 14 um, special education laws that apply to children in school districts versus um, legal entitlements under the charter school law. But the IDEA, that very, very important federal law, applies with equal force to children in charter and cyber charter schools. So Pennsylvania's charter law, charter schools are created and guided by the charter school law. Um, and many of you may be familiar with the fact that it was enacted in 1997, so it's been with us for a while. We've had a growing number of charter schools in various places across Pennsylvania, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, the legislative intent of the charter school law was to improve learning, uh, to provide innovative teaching methods and curriculum and various opportunities, to create professional opportunities and responsibilities, and to expand options for parents in public schools and public education, and also to increase accountability. 
Many folks on the call may be familiar with the fact that the charter school law recently has undergone a major um, actual revision and amendment, um, and the Education Law Center website has some resources to, to that look at that. But what's important with respect to the educational rights of children um, who have disabilities is that charter schools cannot unlawfully discriminate in any admissions practice. They can't uh, discriminate with respect to hiring or operations. They cannot be sectarian in their operations. They can't provide religious instruction or display religious objects. They are in every way a public school. Um, and it's important to recognize that with respect to enrollment and admission to charter schools, uh, children have equal rights to admission. Um, and they cannot be discriminated against on the basis of their disability. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So just to put this in context, I thought it was important to show you sort of the charter school student enrollment nationally and how it's rising. Forty-two states in the District of Columbia have laws authorizing charter schools, and there are only a handful of schools that actually have no charter school law. So if you look at it by the numbers, you'll see that charter schools are expanding. So in Pennsylvania, you'll see on this map um, that in the area around Philadelphia, you see 88 charter schools. That's the majority of charter schools. There are also a number um, of charter schools in various counties, such as Allegheny and York County. Um, and you can see sort of where those brick-and-mortar charter schools are located. So when I'm talking about charter schools, I'm sort of talking about brick-and-mortar. Um, the other schools, of course, are cyber charters, and those are authorized by the state. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. So 108,942 students in Pennsylvania were enrolled in charter schools in um, October 2012. Of those students, approximately 34,000 were in cyber charter programs. So you can see um, there are actually a number of states, 12 states, that um, prohibit any cyber charter schools. Um, but actually, it's Arizona, it's uh, Ohio, Arizona, and Pennsylvania have the highest number of children attending cyber schools. So I wanted us to look at students with disability enrolled in charter schools. And we've broken this down by the um, sort of special education percentage in special ed. And then um, you'll also see a speech language disability. So, we're, so if you look at this chart, I think it really very vividly illustrates that um, we'll have, for example, in Philadelphia County, 14% uh, um, in special education. And then if you look at the percentage in uh, special education and charter school, you'll see that at 12 percent. Um, but what we really see is that in that last uh, box, you'll see that majority of children who are in cyber, who are in, excuse me, charter schools in general are more likely to have a specific learning disability or speech and language impairment. So they're more likely to actually have more of a mild uh, disability. You don't see as many children with uh, having emotional support needs or children with multiple disabilities in those contexts. So I thought it might be um, useful to sort of look at this. Um, and we're, in, at the Education Law Center, we're sort of concerned about this. We're interested in ensuring that children who have multiple disabilities, uh, various disabilities, regardless of severity, can access charter schools and make sure that folks are not counseled away from applying to charter schools. Uh, that they're not asking to, for example, see an IEP before you can apply to be in the lottery. We want to ensure equal access to charter schools, and that's uh, one of the uh, main objectives that we've been focusing on lately. So a cyber charter school is an independent public school established and operated under a charter, and rather than it being authorized by a school district, it's authorized by the Pennsylvania Department of Education, in which the school uses technology in order to provide a significant portion of its curriculum. So, of course, we're familiar with cyber charters as being an online curriculum. Um, and they deliver a significant portion of instruction to its students online through an electronic means. Um, and it's organized as a public nonprofit corporation. So typically, students enrolled in a cyber charter school are educated in their homes with a computer that's actually provided by the cyber charter. Any student in Pennsylvania is eligible to attend a cyber charter school, regardless of where they're located. The charter is issued by PDE rather than the local school board, and the state 
is um, actually responsible then as the authorizer. There are currently 16 cyber charter schools across Pennsylvania, <clears throat> and there have been additional eight cyber charters that have applied for application that we're generally aware of. In 2012-2013, uh, uh, students from 498 school districts were enrolled in cyber charter programs. Um, so that's important, too, that we find a growing number of school districts that also have cyber charter. They have started their own cyber charter programs. Those are not cyber charter schools, but rather have programs. So again, as I mentioned, over 34,000 attend cyber charter schools. Um, just over 5,000 of those cyber charter students were students with disabilities. And very, very, very importantly, um, as we'll talk about it as we uh, go along, just to, to remind everyone, so those children attending cyber charters are entitled to exactly the same um, opportunities that they would receive in public school. So, for example, they need uh, specially designed instruction. They need related services. All of those things have to be provided to children with disabilities. And obviously, they're entitled to a free, appropriate public education as well. So charter schools in Pennsylvania are are educating, we think, on, on the whole, an equitable share of children with disabilities overall. But very significantly, most students with disability in charter schools have speech or language impairment or specific learning disabilities, more mild disabilities. And they're serving a very small number of students with complex support needs. So we really um, want to look at that issue and ensure that there is equal access to cyber charters. Charter schools' legal mandates require all charter schools to comply with all federal laws, policies, case law relevant to public schools. They have to comply with the charter school law and Pennsylvania laws, for example, about enrollment and admissions process or school discipline laws. They have to comply with all of that. They comply with all state laws and policies applicable to charter schools that are set forth in the charter school law. Um, and they have to have um, meaningful parent involvement community involvement, and they have to ensure accountability by the school district that authorized them. They have to provide a minimum of 180 days of instruction per year, and of course that's our public school standard. Um, and they also participate in the PSSAs. So they have to, currently the PSSAs, that will be uh, the keystones as well, um, in a manner in which the school district where the charter is located is scheduled to participate. So all of those apply to charter schools. I just wanted to note if anyone has, uh, can, can put themselves on mute, that would be great. I don't know if everyone is on mute at this time. Okay, so barriers for students with disabilities. Here are the concerns that we're seeing. I have, may not have mentioned this before, but we have a helpline, for example, um, at the Education Law Center. And these are the kinds of issues that we deal with that people call us about. Um, and that's open to anyone in the state to call and to ask questions. So some charter schools we uh, are concerned may be discouraging parents of students with disabilities from actually applying to the school. Of course, that is strictly prohibited. That would violate federal law. That would violate Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Cannot discriminate on the basis of disabilities in any manner. And we're concerned that there may be that kind of, you know, uh, discouraging of parents saying, well, we don't currently have a program that might fit your needs at this time. And that is, you know, you, that, that is absolutely strictly prohibited. If that, if you know of that going on, we kind of want to hear about it because it's very critically important to us to ensure equal access and full inclusion. Some charters may suggest that they're not equipped to meet the needs of a child with disabilities. If they're not, they have to find a way to make that happen. So we have to ensure that the charter schools are meeting their requirements as a local education agency to ensure that they are meeting the needs of, of all exceptional children. So all charter schools are schools of choice. So parents may choose to withdraw their child if their special education needs are not being met. That's something that's critically important, too, that, um, that it is always a school of choice with respect to a charter, a cyber charter, or a brick and mortar charter. And some charter schools, we're concerned, may be enforcing stricter school discipline codes. So again, all of those school discipline laws that apply to children with special education um, needs apply with equal force to the children who are attending charter schools. So we must ensure, for example, that a manifestation determination is done if there's a school discipline issue. We have to ensure that children are not disciplined in a charter school 
on the basis of their disability as a result of a failure of a school to follow an IEP. All of those issues need to be addressed in the same manner as they would in public school. So that's really critically important. We're very, very concerned that charter schools um, in particular may be um, actually enforcing, because they tend to have stricter discipline codes, may be applying those um, to children with disabilities in a manner that is not uh, permissible. So other barriers and obstacles to students with disabilities, admission, applications, and documents. So you have to be applied by lottery often to charter schools because they have um, only a limited number of slots. So in order to apply to a charter school, those applications cannot be requesting information that is not important to the lottery process. For example, you only need four things to uh, to be admitted to a school. So you have to show proof of age or immunizations, proof of residency, and an Act 26 statement. But for example, before that lottery process begins, you would not ask, for example, to see the IEP, to see what the special education needs are of the child. None of that uh, would be a part of the inquiry. All children with disabilities would apply in the same manner as any other child, so that's important. They can't have criteria that might be discriminatory against children with disabilities. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so they may have, in the admissions process, they can have specific grade levels. They could say, you know what, we're just starting our charter school, and the first year we're only going to cover these particular grades. They can do that, so that's, but that's permissible. Um, they can concentrate on a particular area. They can say, you know what, we're really going to be a performing arts school or we're going to really be a science and math school, and they can make that important. Um, but they cannot discriminate on the basis of ability of academic achievement, so that's important. There are timelines and deadlines for applying to charter schools. Um, at the current time, I know Philadelphia is involved in looking at universal enrollment to see if there's an easier way for folks to apply to charter schools at the same time. At the current time, we have different charter schools that may have different deadlines and timelines. All of those are available on the school district website of the authorizing school district. So, for example, in Philadelphia, you would look there to find out what those deadlines were. So provision of special education supports and services. Charter schools, again, and I, I might be beating a dead horse here, but they have to uh, provide the same level of services, whatever that child needs, in order to make progress. You know, we talk about free, appropriate public education, that children with disabilities are entitled to that under the IDEA. But what's really important is that, is that the child is able to make progress. That, they are, that you're providing supports, intervention services, related services that the child needs in order to make progress. So charter schools are responsible for providing that. If their particular school doesn't offer a particular class or a particular related service, they need to go out and see where that is available and provide that. By the same token, in the cyber school context, if you need related services, for example, an IU would be coming to the home and providing those to the child who's attending the cyber program. You still need to do specially designed instruction. You would need to have a, a curriculum where you're providing that. So even in the cyber school, which shouldn't be even, but in the cyber school context, you have to ensure that that is being provided to children with disabilities. So all of that um, is to say that sometimes these can be barriers. We have some charter schools and they've just started up and they're just learning how to do it. We have other charter schools that have been doing this and they understand what their obligations are under the law and they're doing it well. Um, and we have to ensure that children are being educated in the least restrictive environment. So that mandate is to ensure that children are to the greatest extent possible being educated with non-disabled peers. Again, applies to equal with equal force to children who are um, in charter schools and children attending cyber schools. So um, some emerging issues regarding, regarding cybers. Um, Sometimes we have found uh, that children may be sent to cybers um, when, as a district is not meeting their needs and they're in a cyber, uh, they may choose to go to a cyber school. The quality of the education, um, there's at, at the current time no high quality research uh, that uh, demonstrates that full-time virtual school is an adequate replacement for traditional face-to-face -face teaching. 
Um, you, if you go on our website, we have a lot of materials about resources and research that's been done with respect to cyber charters, so you may want to look at that. Um, with respect to cyber charters, none of them, none of the 16 made adequate yearly progress in the last few years. The graduation rates are lower. Their truancy rates tend to be higher. Uh, there may be a lot of reasons for that. Um, but, you know, we do, uh, uh, you know, invite you to really look at the information that we have with respect to cyber charters. Also, I'd recommend that folks go on the Pennsylvania Department of Education website. Uh, where they have all of the testing scores for all schools across Pennsylvania, including um, charter schools. So it's very, very useful um, information to be able to look at those and critically look at the at those issues. Um, children who attend cyber schools tend to do so for a short, shorter period of time. We call it having a high churn rate, where they may be in cyber charter just for a few months, and then they go back and go to traditional schools. So that's an issue to consider and to look at, just in terms of continuity of curriculum um, and ensuring that children are making progress as they're going from one context to another. Um, and that one of the, the issues that we're concerned with at the Education Law Center is the ability um, of cyber charter schools um, to meet the needs of educationally at-risk children um, in general, and that includes children who may be experiencing homelessness, um, children who are in other at-risk categories, but also very specifically with respect to uh, children um, who have special education needs. To ensure that their needs are being fully met in a cyber charter in the same way that they uh, would be in a public school. So to ensure that they're receiving the services that they need, that it's individually tailored to meet their needs, that they have objective goals and measurements, that we're really critically uh, looking at this and getting progress reports, ensuring that they're making progress. Um, so to ensure that all of those protections are in place in the cyber school context is very important. Um, children should not be sent to cyber programs, by the way, as a school discipline placement. It is not a school discipline uh, placement. It is, it's not an alternative education for disruptive youth placement, for example. A cyber program is simply another educational module. It's another way to receive instruction. Um, it may be offered as an option, as an educational placement, but it really is not a, a school discipline um, it's not a, a school discipline setting, so that's very, very critically important. Um, and I guess one of uh, my concerns is, too, we want to ensure that if a child is attending a cyber program, at the current time, these programs are not independently monitored. They're not reviewed. There's no disaggregated data that's collected with respect to student achievement of children that may be in cyber programs. So whereas we're able to look at children attending cyber schools, um, the cyber charter schools, we're not able to do, we're not able to look at what's happening with respect to children in cyber programs in school districts. So it also raises a change in placement issue. Would, would it be a change of placement for a child with a disability? And so it's very important to look at that issue because if it is, and, and it, I think there's a strong argument to be made in many contexts that it would be, you need a notice of recommended uh, educational placement. Uh, that a parent would sign off on, you shouldn't be putting a child in that program without parental consent because it's essentially maybe cha it's a change in placement for that child. It's different with respect to who they're interacting with to the extent they may be with non-disabled peers. It's a change with respect to what's in what their placement may have been um, in their NORAP. So it's an important flag that I wanted to raise for everyone on the call. And again, we need to look at the quality of education issues. Um, folks on the call may be familiar with the fact that the Education Law Center had actually um, provided testimony to the state uh, requesting that they uh, apply a moratorium on cyber charters until um, we can get more information about, um, you know, how children are doing and uh, we have testified with respect to applications that have um, that are now currently pending with the Pennsylvania Department of Education. So again, all that's available on our website. So um, just to go over the rules with respect to legal protections for students with disability. So charter schools cannot discriminate against a student for admission based on intellectual ability or disability. So they cannot make that a criterion, a basis for admission. Students with disabilities enrolled in charter schools are entitled to all the same rights 
as their non-disabled peers. So with respect to admission, with respect to prompt enrollment, every child should be enrolled within five business days of, of, of providing the documentation. Um, and one, in the charter context, once they're in the lottery, if you're sex, accepted into the lottery, you know that usually the spring before. But the, all of those rights apply. Students with disabilities very, very significantly retain all federal rights and protections guaranteed by federal disability law. So that includes the IDEA. It includes Section 504. That's the prohibition against discrimination on the basis of disability. The ADA, in terms of ensuring access to that school and physical um, changes that may need to be made. And certain rights under Chapter 14 also apply. So let's just go over what those are. Um, charter schools subject to all federal education and civil rights laws, relevant federal case law. Okay. So the IDEA, just in broad strokes, they're entitled to an evaluation, to be evaluated. The child find obligation that charter schools, just like public schools, must identify, locate, and evaluate children who are suspected to have disabilities. They have an absolute obligation to do that under the law. They need to provide an IEP for those students who are found to be eligible. They need to offer services. They need to ensure that parents consent to not only the initial evaluation and to reevaluation, but consent to services starting, that they're participating in IEP meetings, that they are um, that they have an individualized educational program. All of those rights under the IDA apply with equal force. So all and every single one of them, with respect to transition planning, with respect to all of those issues, uh, apply to children. Um, um, you know, all the rights under the IDA apply. Um, and, and all of those school discipline protections, again, those also apply. So to ensure that children don't have a change of placement and all of those uh, rules that apply, that would be an entirely different uh presentation, which I'm happy to do, but that's a different issue. But all of those rights apply. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, again, that applies. So children who may have a chronic condition, for example, they need an accommodations plan in school, whether it's for type 1 diabetes or asthma or a behavioral uh, a plan or whatever it is, the, the Section 504 um, requirement that they evaluate those children, that they provide accommodations in school, that they have a service agreement that delineates what their protections are, all of those rights apply. The Civil Rights Act applies. There can be no discrimination on the basis of color, on the basis of ethnicity, et cetera. All of those rights apply. Title IX applies, um, the protection, federal protection with re respect to um, ensuring that uh, that girls have equal access, all of those issues apply. The McKinney-Vento Act, which ensures school stability for children experiencing homelessness, that applies as well. The No Child Left Behind Act, FERPA laws, ensured that uh, parents consent to the sharing of, of education records. All of those laws apply with equal force. So under the IDA, ensuring that children have a free, multidisciplinary evaluation. Those evaluations are so critical because that gives you the roadmap for what the child needs in their IEP. So to ensure that they've looked at every area of suspected disability, ensure that it's a multidisciplinary evaluation, that you have a baseline that you're able to refer to, that you've considered um, all of the needs of this child, that there has been a really significant, you know, uh, deep dive into what this child needs. Eligibility determinations of the, the IDA apply in the same way in terms of who would be um, eligible under the IDA of, uh, you know, where we say, yes, they do qualify, they do clearly have a disability with respect to a specific learning disability or um, who, a child who has emotional support needs, all the same eligibility criteria apply. The development of an individualized program is really critically important that we've gone through, that we've established those objective goals and benchmarks. We've established a way to actually evaluate whether a child is making progress, that we've ensured that that IEP is shared with all the teachers who need to have it, that a child who needs, um, for example, behavioral support plan has one in place, and that it is updated 
uh, when it needs to be, if there's any kind of incident that it needs to be updated or because of change in circumstances, that we've ensured that children are included in all things, that they're in the least restrictive environment, to the largest extent possible that they're with non-disabled peers. Um, even if they were in a full-time or part-time emotional support class, that there are other opportunities for those children to interact with non-disabled peers, very, very important. All of the procedural safeguards that parents need to be notified about a change in placement, about a proposed change to the IEP, the due process protections that allow parents to challenge um, what, you know, the services that they're receiving to say they're not receiving what was in the IEP or uh, this service needs to be added and it wasn't, or to challenge that placement. All of those protections must be in place um, and utilized in the charter school context. So just two notes here. Chapter 14 is the series of statute and, and uh, regulations promulgated under Chapter 14. Charter, chapter 14 is essentially the state um, implementation of the IDEA that delineates all of the legal responsibilities that school districts have to students with disabilities. Now, that law does not apply to charter schools. Instead, there is a separate special set of regulations under Chapter 711, which deals specifically with charter schools and children with disabilities, students with disabilities. Now, importantly, 711 absolutely reflects what's in the IDEA, and it must, because all of those federal laws apply. But there are some um, significant differences that I just wanted to flag for you. It specifies how the Pennsylvania charter schools will comply with all the federal disabilities laws, including the IDEA and Section 504, so it incorporates what's in Chapter 15 of the school code. It incorporates the federal regulations that are um, in some of our state regulations. Now, it does require all special education teachers to be state certified, notwithstanding the fact that in the charter school, unlike school districts, Charter schools require that only 75% of charter school teachers be state certified, but it requires that all special education teachers be state certified. Um, I had one other, I'm not, maybe I'm not finding it here, um, but there were two important distinctions uh, that I wanted to mention to you as well. Um, I think it must be in a later slide, but it is with respect to two distinctions between um, charters under Chapter uh, 14 and 711, and essentially, uh, I think I must come to that at a later slide, so I will do it then, sorry. <laughs> um, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Section 504, again, charter schools um, mu that must comply with all of those um, important protections. So they cannot discriminate against students on the basis of disability, and they cannot exclude from participation in particular activities children who can't participate. Instead, they must accommodate those children. They must ensure that they have equal access to the benefits of those activities in that education, and they cannot be treated differently due to disability. So admissions, again, all resident students in Pennsylvania are eligible to attend any charter schools, although the, the authorizing school district um, may actually say we're going to take the children from our from our authorizing school district first that go to the charter schools. That they can do. Charters cannot discriminate on admissions policies or practices on the basis of intellectual disability, athletic ability, measures of achievement or aptitude, the status of a person with a disability. They can't discriminate on the basis of proficiency in English or anything else that would be illegal if applied by a school district. Pennsylvania law mandates that charter schools like school districts immediately enroll eligible children upon presentation of just those four documents. We call it four in the door that I mentioned before, proof of age, immunizations, proof of residence, residency, um, and a statement, an Act 26 statement about any um, school discipline issues for weapons or other serious offense. Those are the only four things you need, and you should be enrolled within five days. Charter cannot set forth its admission criteria to limit admission on the basis of disability. It can limit it to a particular grade, area of concentration, or establish reasonable criteria to evaluate prospective students with respect to the area of concentration. Now, that's really supposed to be relevant to the child's interest in those areas, and it's not supposed to be based on aptitude. 
Charter schools can admit with first preference students who reside in the district where the charter school is authorized, children whose parents have been actively engaged in the development of the charter school, and they can also give first preference to siblings of students already enrolled in the charter school. Otherwise, charter schools must admit all students selected at random from a pool of candidates who meet the charter's legally established criteria. For example, if they need to demonstrate an interest in the performing arts or in science, um, you know, those kinds of issues. Um, that established, re you know, criteria that's legally authorized, they can utilize that. But again, it's got to be from this random pool of candidates. So charters can enroll if space permits non-resident students. Again, any child in the Commonwealth can go to a charter school, even if it's located in another district. So I think we already, um, I'm sorry, I seem to be going backwards even though I'm pressing my forward key. This is odd. I apologize. Uh, okay. So let's just go over some of these um, issues in a little bit more uh, depth. So the right to an evaluation, charters, let me just make sure that we've got that, okay. So charters are responsible for conducting evaluations to determine if, the, if a student is eligible for special education supports and services. So again, the usual 60-day uh, calendar days, excluding the summer months, applies. Again, the parent must consent in writing. They have to sign that permission to evaluate form, provide that to the school, and the same rule um, that if, uh, with respect to an evaluation, if you ask for an evaluation, it must be in writing, but if you do it orally, the charter school should be giving you um, the uh, piece of paper asking that, that the, you know, promptly so that you can uh, fill in, you know, you, if you ask for verbally, they have to give you the consent form that you need to complete. Um, they must have a system for screening children to determine whether they should be referred for a special education evaluation. Again, that child fine obligation applies with equal force. So parents must make the request in writing. Again, if it's oral, then the request form, uh, they have to provide a permission to evaluate within 10 days of the oral request. Parent must sign permission to evaluate consent form to trigger the, the school's duty to do that initial evaluation within the 60 calendar day. Um, time frame. Again, that's the, the requirement. Um, parents have a right to refuse uh, to have their child evaluated. Um, if a parent believes an evaluation by a charter school is deficient, they have the right to request an independent educational evaluation. They have the right to challenge the school's decision to deny uh, such a request. So all of those um, protections apply. You have a right to a reevaluation every three years, three years, or in the case of a child with intellectual disabilities, every two years. So again, all of those rights apply. The procedural safeguards, again, applies with equal force. Parents of students with disabilities have the same procedural safeguards, including the, opp the opportunity to meaningfully participate in the evaluation process and the development of their child's IEP to be at that table to participate. They're entitled to prior written notice of any change to their child's IEP or change in placement, the opportunity to appeal if they don't agree, um, and um, the same right to the dispute resolution process. A child in a charter school or a cyber charter um, has a right to uh, the development of the IEP by the IEP team within 30 days after the evaluation report is completed. You come together and, and you sit there to develop the IEP meeting. Again, the parent uh, must be included in that. At least one regular education teacher, one special education teacher, administrator, and the child. Um, the parent may bring other individuals who they would like to participate, may have knowledge or expertise about the child, they have that same right to invite anyone that they want to to attend that meeting. So that's an important protection. The IEP team must then review the IEP at least once every year. But again, remember, a parent can request an IEP meeting at any time. And the same holds true in the charter school context. Parents or the school may request an IEP team meeting. Um, and that's really an important protection um, for, for parents to do that. So you're entitled to a free, appropriate public education. So what does that mean? 
the case law uh, at the federal level and also um, in our jurisdiction within the Third Circuit talks about the right of a child to confer, to receive a meaningful benefit. A meaningful benefit means that your child is making progress in light of their ability. So in an IEP context, that's why it's so critically important that the IEP has those measurable goals and benchmarks so that we can assess and evaluate whether the child is making progress and that we can make a, a kind of a record on that. So you're entitled to a free, appropriate public education, and if you believe your child is not receiving a FAPE, that child may be entitled to compensatory education services to make up for the time period uh, that they were denied a FAPE. So again, the right to go to due process, all of that applies. So an IEP is what you would receive if you're in a charter school or a cyber charter for a child with a disability outline, the child's special education program or related services. It's tailored to meet the child's unique needs. Um, it, the, the services the child will receive are listed with great precision. It says what services they will receive. It says the time that they will receive, for example, if they're getting speech and language services, they'll say how many times they'll meet per week, et cetera. Um, the right to receive specially designed instruction, that's modification to the curriculum or support services, their transition plan, and they have a right to ensure that they're receiving a FAPE, which means that they're, they're making progress and that that progress is um, documented. So I mentioned before, and I apologize, I was looking for this slide earlier, the two differences in the charter school context from the school district context is there's a, a caseload requirement. So each student with a disability who is in a school district must be assigned to a special education teacher's caseload. So it's specific that the student is assigned to one particular special education teacher's caseload. There is no such requirement in charter schools. So you could have a lot of students that are assigned more generally. They're not within a specific teacher's uh, caseload, so it's not limited. The idea there is to ensure that a child is really receiving that important level of individualized attention. Um, and that's set forth in our state code under Chapter 14. However, it is absent from 711. So that's very, very important. Um, and if you um, have a child who is in a charter school and that is an issue, we would be very, very interested in hearing what your experiences are with respect to that. The other issue is what we call the age range provision, which talks about uh, the maximum age range in specialized settings, the chronological difference in years, age years, in elementary school. For example, in grades, uh, in kindergarten through sixth grade, um, uh, we talk about three years difference in terms of chronological age in the secondary school con context, seventh through eleventh grade. We're talking about a four year differential. So a student with a disability may not be placed in a class in which the chronological age from the youngest to the oldest exceeds these limits unless an exception is determined to be appropriate by the IEP team. Okay, so that um, requirement is actually absent in the charter school, in the, the charter law, so that does not apply. So protection in the school discipline context, that's an important protection in charter schools. So, for example, we have state due process laws that are applicable to suspensions and expulsions. You have a right to a formal hearing before you are expelled from school. That's a critical legal entitlement because education is a legal entitlement, and you cannot be deprived of, of that property right without a formal hearing. Suspensions only require an informal hearing. There are very specific um, timelines that apply. Less than three days, there is just a right to notice, but not really an informal hearing. Four to ten days, you do receive the right to have an informal hearing, the right to present evidence to explain why the child should not be suspended. All of those state law requirements apply. A charter school may not expel or suspend students for failure to meet the charter school's academic requirements. So if the ch child is not doing well in the charter school, you cannot suspend that child. That is never a reason in the, in the charter school to suspend a child. So all of the IDEA protections apply with equal force. Again, the right to manifestation determination within 10 days of an incident for which a child might be disciplined. The IEP team has to get together to determine whether 
the uh, proposed change in placement for that child is the result of the child's disability, it's related to the child's disability, or is a result of the school district's failure to follow the child's IEP. And if, if any of those are true, the child cannot be disciplined. There cannot be a change in placement for the child. So the child can't be suspended, the child can't be expelled, the child can't be placed in alternative uh, alternative education for disruptive youth. None of that can happen because you cannot um, apply a school uh, discipline um, punishment to a child as a re based on the disability, okay? So that's a very important critical legal entitlement. Again, applies as equal force to the student attending the school district school as well as the child in a cyber school. Again, the, like, the right to least restrictive environment to ensure that students with disabilities are educated with non-disabled peers to the greatest extent possible, that they are removed from the regular education classroom only, only when the nature or severity of the child's disability is such that education in the regular education uh, classes or setting cannot be achieved satisfactorily. Because what we're looking at first is having the child stay in the regular education classroom um, to ensure that they receive supplementary aids and services within the context of that regular education classroom and that they are only um, that, that they're only removed from that setting when it's absolutely necessary. And again, the IDEA requires that this that the charter school or the LEA, the local education agency, for offer a full continuum of placements for students. So you cannot say, uh, we're only offering you one placement, your child has to go to this very, very limited segregated setting. They're not allowed to do that. They have to say, we're offering you a continuum of settings, here are the options from the least restrictive to the most restrictive, and that's a critical right that children have. Um, students with disabilities with respect to transportation, they're entitled to free and appropriate transportation as necessary to attend their special education program. So the same rights that you see apply with respect to related services to a child in the school district also applies to charter schools. And when it's needed, the type and amount of transportation would be included in the IEP as a related service. The dispute resolution options for a child in a charter school are the same as they are for the child in the school district. So if a parent disagrees with the services provided under the special education plan, under the IEP, or they disagree with the, um, with the placement of the child in a particular program, they can say, I want to mediate this request, uh, which means that the parties get together and, and with a mediator and try to um, hash things out without attorney. You could ask for a formal due process hearing, so you can file a complaint. Um, if you go on the PATAN website, P-A-T-T-A-N, you'll see that there are a lot of resources there that enable parents to file complaints on their own, or um, if they need an attorney, there are many options for that, um, it would, through the Disabilities Rights Network or the Education Law Center or other places. So you have a right to file a complaint to challenge what's going on. Um, you also have a right to an administrative complaint, a division of compliance or DOC complaint. And that's something that can be filed with the Department of Education, alleging a violation of special education laws has to be within one year of when the uh, alleged violation occurred. Um, and then that will be um, investigated and a decision will be made by the Department of Education uh, Bureau of Special Education Services within 60 days of receiving the complaint. They do their investigation and they issue corrective action um, as appropriate. So all of those dispute resolution options are available for children in charter schools and children in cyber charters. So I wanted to provide a sort of case study examples um, as a launching point here so that you can then look at what happens sort of for a child in the special education context in a charter school versus a child who may be attending, who may be homeschooled, or may be in a privately placed parochial or private school. So, for example, um, I will give you an example of a case that I handled recently on behalf of a child with multiple disabilities who was attending a cyber charter school. This child um, actually needed, uh, had multiple disabilities, um, uh, physically uh, and had uh, barriers with respect to uh, speech, language, hearing, etc. Um, she was attending the cyber charter school. 
Um, she was entitled to related services, and that included speech language coming to her home. She needed some socialization um, opportunities, so that was also provided through related services that came to her home through the um, intermediate unit where she where her home was located. In addition, she was entitled to specially designed instruction. So the instruction that she was receiving, the curriculum over the internet, online, that needed to be individualized for her. And there were specific requirements um, articulated in the IEP that the teacher was going to follow. In that particular context, the teacher did not provide any specially designed instruction for that child. In fact, she was simply accessing the same curriculum that every other student was accessing. So there really wasn't any attempt to modify the curriculum in order to address the needs of this child. In addition, although she was entitled to a specific amount of speech um, and language services that were supposed to be provided on a weekly basis, and again, you know, that was in the IEP, that was not being provided. In addition, there were additional related services that the mom wanted the child to receive that the child did not receive. So in that particular context, uh, there was a due process complaint that was filed that explained that this child was entitled to specially designed instruction. The child was not making progress. She needed to be in a different environment. Um, this was not, you know, uh, working for her. We're trying to find a way that either specially designed instruction would be provided online or uh, that the, the resolution in this case was that uh, she was actually ended up attending um, a different program, um, an IU-operated program, that was able uh, to address her particular needs, um, and that worked for her. So she, in that context, was entitled to the dispute resolution context. She was entitled to um, actually receive compensatory uh, education services for the time that she was denied a free, appropriate public education. So that is an example of, um, of what a child, a student with disabilities, would uh, be entitled to in a charter school or a cyber charter. Again, they're entitled to all of those fundamental legal protections that apply to children attending school districts. So that gives you an, an example of what would happen. So I'd like now to uh, mention two things before we move on to children who are homeschooled and children who are in um, also in a private or parochial school. Um, it, just in terms of ch children in charter schools, the Southern Poverty Law Center filed an administrative complaint and actually um, a federal lawsuit after that on behalf of thousands of children in New Orleans who were uh, students with disabilities that alleged a denial of a free appropriate public education access to the city's charter schools. Um, in, as folks may be aware, New Orleans, over 70% of all schools are charter schools. But the um, information that they had um, reflected that children with disabilities were significantly underrepresented in charter schools. So essentially, 70% of the children are attending charter schools, but many of the children with no significant disabilities were left behind in the school districts. Um, they also found that some charter schools suspended children with disabilities at rates 100 percent higher than the state average. This is a critical issue. Uh, disproportionately, children with disabilities in Pennsylvania um, are often placed in alternative education for disruptive youth. Um, some of you may have seen the Education Law Center recently filed a Department of Justice complaint on behalf of children with disabilities who were disproportionately placed in alternative education settings. We had a number of school districts highlighted in that complaint that's available on our website where over 50% of the children um, with disabilities were in alternative education for disruptive youth, whereas they only represented, for example, 13 to 16% um, of the school district of uh, children with disabilities. So it's an important issue to look at. Um, they found that only 6.8% of children with disabilities were graduating with a high school diploma, and 49% of children with disabilities were failing to finish school. So that resulted in um, their filing this important uh, federal lawsuit. So I just wanted to highlight that as an example 
of uh, why it's so critically important that we ensure equal access to charter schools for all students um, and ensure that their needs are being met and that the important school discipline protections that are available to children with disabilities are being um, upheld and are being complied with in the charter school context. So um, this just uh, mentions that there are a lot of sort of advocacy opportunities in the charter school context. I would like to hear from folks on this call if they have experienced any of these barriers to admission or find out what your experience has been in charter schools to ensure, um, because it's an important issue, an advocacy issue for us at the Education Law Center. And also, we're very concerned about the cyber charter context. Um, to make sure that cyber charters are not refusing to educate children with disabilities in the same way and to the extent that they would be in a public school. We want to ensure that we're monitoring um, how those children are doing, ensuring that they're making progress. Very, very concerned about the um, specially designed instruction and making modifications to the curriculum in the cyber charter context to ensuring access to related services and complying with all the procedural safeguards to ensure parent involvement. So um, just wanted to mention that to everyone on the line. So now I'm going to move on to uh, the rights of students who are in the who are homeschooled. Um, and I think what you will see here is that the rights and legal entitlements are vastly different in this context. So we're going to look at what those are. So again, going back to our framework, I'd like to start with the right to an evaluation. So parents can request an initial valuation and re-evaluation should be made in writing to the child's uh, resident school district. So as folks know, if you have decided to homeschool your child, um, it's absolutely an option that you have under the school code and an option that is available. Um, it's critically important that a plan is in place as an education plan as to how we're going to address the educational needs of each child, um, that the school district has authorized all of this, that they have a plan that's been reviewed by the school district, and that it has been approved. So when we move to um, ensure that children with disabilities um, uh, have an evaluation. This is an issue that, that should always be raised, but also it is, again, a child find obligation so the school district should be identifying children who may need to be evaluated for special education uh, services. So you have a right to an evaluation, and that would be conducted by the child's resident uh, school. So wherever the child is living, it's your local school district that would be doing that evaluation. They are required um, to sit down with the family, explain the results of that evaluation. And again, as I mentioned earlier, all evaluations can I have to make sure that they're not discriminatory in any manner. If a child, for example, is an English language learner, that evaluation must be done in the child's native language. If, it's, if the parent is participating and the parent does not speak English, we have to ensure that the uh, parent has a right to interpretation and translation so everything is explained. Again, it's got to be a multidisciplinary evaluation so that we're looking um, at in different contexts at what this child may need, and we're looking at physical, emotional uh, uh, health needs of the child. We've got a full history. There's been an interview um, of the parent, of teachers, et cetera. So all of those evaluations should look essentially uh, very, very similar, as it's the same, actually, as they would um, for a child who's attending a school district. Valuations are conducted according to the same rules as children attending public schools. So that right to an evaluation is the same. Now, we talked earlier about children in the charter schools and cyber charters as having a right to a free, appropriate public education, ensuring that students are receiving a meaningful educational benefit, that they are making progress every, you know, a, a based on what their abilities are. Now, the right to a state includes very important legal protection. And that means that if a child is denied a free appropriate public education, you have a right to a remedy. As I mentioned earlier, that means that you may be entitled to compensatory education services. That means additional educational services 
Um, actually, it's for every hour of every day that the child was denied a free appropriate public education. For example, I gave you um, the example of a case that I just handled of a child in a cyber charter school. So she was denied a free appropriate public education, let's say, for a year. She is um, actually entitled, if she were in a, a high school, to uh, a potentially 990 hours of compensatory education services. So those, that kind of really potent remedy um, is not available to a child who's being homeschooled. That right to a free appropriate public education is not something that would apply to a child who's being homeschooled. So the type of plan and services provided. So in the charter school context, um, in the context of a school district, we talk about an IEP, an individualized educational program. It is tailored to meet the individual needs of the child. It has looked at what adult, at assessments of the child. It's determined what the child needs. It says very specifically, not Johnny will read. It says that Johnny will understand um, this, you know, uh, first grade paragraph that he'll uh, recognize these many words in this uh, amount of time. It's very, very detailed and specific because you need measurable benchmarks in order to determine whether a child is actually making progress. So it's very, very precise. So the IEP is what is essentially the contract for the child. It's what the school will provide to the child. It says what services they'll receive. It says how often they will receive them. It walks through all of the options for the child and, and explains how the specially designed instruction will be provided, how the curriculum will be modified, et cetera. Now, in, for, the, for the child who's being homeschooled, it's, it's, it's very, very different. They receive a home education plan for a child who's eligible for special education. Now, that will address the specific needs of the child. It must be approved by a Pennsylvania certified uh, special education teacher or licensed clinical or certified school psychologist. So essentially, the home education plan is what becomes the contract for that child. That is what should be followed. It's very, very critically important that, in, that an evaluation is done, that it's thorough, and that the home education plan reflects what has been identified as the special education needs of the child. The school district or the intermediate unit can agree with the program supervisor to provide some of those services. So the home education plan will articulate what the child will receive, what the Pennsylvania Certified Special Education teacher feels that they need. Um, it will walk through that, and then the intermediate unit will be providing some of those services. The school district may say, we can provide those services. So um, there may be a right to some services if the child is duly enrolled in the public school. So when we talk about legal entitlement, if the child were duly enrolled in the school district as well as being homeschooled for part of the time, then we talk about that legal entitlement. Otherwise, what we essentially have, the home education plan, explains what the child needs. And um, and the home education plan is walking through how that child will receive those services, whether it will be through the IU or through the school district, or in some cases how things will be um, provided at home through a parent who may be teaching. But in terms of eligibility for special education, it's important to articulate in the home education plan what the child needs and to rely on experts who are uh, providing, who identified those specific needs to have that approved, and once it's approved, that it's being followed. So the right to inclusion in the homeschool context. Pennsylvania law allows children who are homeschooled to participate in some extracurricular activities offered by their homeschool district. Local school districts may but are not required to offer some academic courses to students who are homeschooled, but they're not required to do so. So again, not a legal entitlement, but something that they may do at their option. As with all federally funded programs, students may not be excluded from participation in programs offered by public schools on the basis of their disability. So for example, 
uh, children who are homeschooled may be attending a gym class or may be involved in, in some uh, other extracurricular activities in band or in something. Now, they cannot be excluded on the basis of their disability. They must participate in those extracurricular activities that are offered by their homeschool district to children being homeschooled. So I think that that's uh, very, very important that uh, we ensure that uh, that we're, that children are accessing those. I had a case recently, well, wait till we go to the, uh, to the examples. But, um, but that's a very, very critical, um, right to inclusion and an important piece that we don't want to overlook. So the right to transportation. Any services agreed upon must take place at a public school or licensed private school. So again, that's by agreement, not a legal entitlement, but rather by agreement. Uh, services, um, will not be provided at home, but rather would be provided usually through the public school or somewhere else. So that's where the services will be provided. Transportation services may be agreed to by the school district or by the IU uh, with the program supervisor. I haven't found this to be a particular problem with respect to transportation, um, but I, I don't know. We can hear from other folks afterwards as to whether that's a problem. So the right to dispute resolution. So. Special education services must be agreed upon by the supervisor. That's the home school instructor and the school district or the immediate or the intermediate year. So again, this is by agreement, not a legal entitlement, but rather by agreement. Since there's no duty to provide a free appropriate public education, the parent cannot use the hearing or complaint system to challenge a school district's refusal to provide specific services. However, Parents can use the hearing process or mediation with respect to the duty to evaluate the child. So again, the only legal entitlement is the duty to uh, receive an evaluation. So that's critically important, uh, the evaluation. But beyond that, you're really doing everything by agreement, by agreement of the parties. So coming to a case study example, I wanted to mention with respect to the issue of inclusion, um, I received a call from a child who um, was being homeschooled. The child had um, some significant um, uh, disabilities, wanted to attend um, some of the activities that were provided at the school district, including actually wanted to go to the prom, he wanted to go on the particular field trips. This is something that was available to children who were being homeschooled, um, that, that these were options, but they were told, no, 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 we can't do anything for this child being homeschooled because, um, you know, they're being homeschooled, they chose homeschool, we don't need to do that. Absolutely not. That child was entitled to be included. That inclusion was, was offered to children who were being homeschooled. They needed to make accommodations for him so that he was able to attend the prom, so he was able to participate to the um, extent that he was, that his non-disabled peers who were being homeschooled. So he had an absolute entitlement to that. I've also received several calls in the evaluation context from uh, folks that were being homeschooled who were waiting around, who needed an evaluation. Again, that evaluation, that duty to evaluate, that duty to identify children who are suspected, who may have special education needs, that is an absolute legal entitlement that applies. So if a child is being homeschooled, they, and they want an evaluation and they consent and file that permission to evaluate, that child needs to be evaluated on a prompt basis um, in accordance with the, uh, with the with applicable laws, federal and state. So must be evaluated within that 60-day time frame. So that evaluation is another case example in the homeschool context. Uh, what I really highly recommend for folks um, who have children who are being homeschooled is that you really look at that um, education plan that I had mentioned before, that you really, when you are developing the home education plan, that you are including in that plan uh, what that child needs and that that's been articulated and that you get agreement from the school district or the intermediate unit that they will be providing certain of these services for your child. It's very, very important that we're essentially trying to use that home education plan that that becomes our roadmap. Um, but it's, it's very important to be raising these issues in the beginning so that we um, are integrating 
all of those services, and we've identified those. Um, and make sure that the evaluation, if you have any question as to the depth of the evaluation, that you're looking at that as well, so that we ensure that we've identified everything that should be in the home education plan. Um, so uh, that's the homeschool process. I, the, the, that is what applies to students who are being homeschooled. I'd like to move on now to the rights of students that are placed by parents in parochial or nonprofit private schools. I just want to um, make one point that is probably very clear to everybody on this call, but this is not children who have been placed in a private school by a school district pursuant to an IEP. Those children are public school students. Yes, they're attending a private school, but they're attending that private school by virtue of a placement by a school district. So those children have all the rights, legal entitlements that we've just talked about in terms of the IDEA. That IEP must be followed. They must receive the services that are articulated in the IEP. If there is a problem, you have a right to dispute resolution and a legal right to challenge that in court. All of that applies if you have been placed by your school district. And that school district, even though you're in a private placement, continues to have the obligation to ensure a free, appropriate public education for that child. They must ensure that your child is making progress at that private school if the, or at that intermediate unit um, program where they've been placed. Wherever they've been placed, that resident school district retains the legal obligation to ensure that the child's receiving a free appropriate publication, public education. And if that child isn't, that those students have a right to compensatory education services if, if they're not receiving that. Or to a different placement if they're in a fundamentally inappropriate placement and not uh, receiving what they need in order to make progress. Um, as students with special education needs. But right now, I'm going to turn my attention to parents in paro uh, to, I'm sorry, to students who have been placed by parents in parochial or nonprofit private schools. So starting with the right to an evaluation, a parent's request for an initial evaluation and reevaluations, again, should be made in writing to the child's resident school district. So that's important. Um, now, the evaluation will actually be done by the intermediate unit where that private school is located. So you will see in the basic education circular that has been issued by the Pennsylvania Department of Education, it walks through all of that. But it, it's important to understand that your local school district will not be doing that evaluation if the child has been parentally placed in a private school. Um, the intermediate unit where the private school is located, they will be the ones conducting that evaluation. Again, that evaluation must be conducted according to the same rules as for children attending public schools. And just to reiterate, this is because the IDEA applies to all children. The duty to identify, locate, and evaluate children uh, applies to every child in every state across the nation. So it's important to understand that the right to evaluation applies to all children, even uh, those who are in a private school. Again, these students, like children who are being homeschooled, do not have an illegal entitlement, a right to a free appropriate public education. So the private school is not responsible um, for a failure to meet the child's special education needs. This is considered a choice by a parent who says, I want my child to go to a private school, and therefore you're doing that recognizing that that private school does not have a right, does not have an obligation to meet the special education needs of your child. Now, they continue, if they receive federal funds, they continue to have a legal obligation to accommodate your child. Okay, so they cannot be discriminating against your child on the basis of their disability if they're receiving, if they're recipient of federal funds. That's how 504 works. That's that federal law that says you cannot discriminate on the basis of disability. So children should still be accommodated in school. This is often done by an agreement uh, with the, the private school where you're talking about accommodations. They can't be excluded based on disability. All of those protections apply, but they are not responsible 
for ensuring that your child's needs are being, special education needs are being met, nor is the intermediate unit or school district where the private school is located responsible. They simply do lose that legal entitlement uh, when you've been parentally placed in a private, uh, in a private school. So the type of plan or services provided, now this is important. Children who are placed by parents in a private school are entitled only to something called equitable participation services. You say that 10 times fast, that would be pretty good. Um, which should be listed on an equitable participation services plan. Now this is not an IEP. This is not an individualized education program. Um, and the intermediate unit does not have to provide all of the services that, is list, that are listed on an equitable participation services plan um, if circumstances change. However, these are additional services that are available. For example, I think maybe perhaps the, the most simple example is if your child needs additional tutoring. Um, there may be a mobile uh, tutoring, uh, you know, mobile unit that goes around a bus where tutoring services are provided, that kind of thing. Those are often provided through this equitable participation services plan. So the, the, those services are provided uh, through their EP services, um, and that's great, the equitable participation services. But if they exhaust their state and federal funds and they don't have any EP services available, it's not an entitlement. You can't run into a special education hearing and say, well, we need, you know, we, we, uh, we need these tutoring services. It is simply something additional that's being, um, that, that's being provided. Now, a child may be able to get the services from the local school district, again, if the child is duly enrolled. If they're uh, duly enrolled in public and private school, that is an option. Non-religious private schools do have a duty to provide, as I mentioned, uh, reasonable accommodations for children with qualifying disabilities, aka that's that service agreement or 504 plan would apply to a child who has a chronic condition or a child who may have um, any kind of qualifying disability. Um, so again, you might, we must ensure that children with disabilities are accommodated in schools. But again, that those are uh, non-religious schools that are um, again, receiving federal funds. So equitable participation services is something that you should definitely inquire about and see what is available um, because the EP services plan um, is something you can call your intermediate unit and find out what's being um, offered and what might be available in this context. But again, um, if the funds run out, then the, you don't have a legal entitlement to that, um, so they would not be available. The right to inclusion, federal law, the ADA prohibits discrimination by a private or non-parochial school. So again, we must ensure that accommodations are there to, for inclusion, so that's very important. Private non-parochial schools must eliminate any unnecessary eligibility standards that would deny access to individuals with disabilities. They must make reasonable accommodations and policies and practice procedures unless such a change would be an undue burden or be a fundamental change to the nature of the program. Um, and I just wanted to reference, this would apply to children who might be going, for example, to a preschool um, or who might be in any kind of a, of a preschool program. So private schools, non-parochial schools must eliminate, um, must really address this issue. Um, for example, if it would, if it's a very small, uh, I don't know, let's say it's a church program that has a very small preschool. Um, if there are instances where they may say, well, this is an undue burden for us to make a fundamental change. For example, uh, we have to expand our doors to accommodate um, some you know, a wheelchair or something like that. There may be certain things where they um, would be able to say this would be an undue burden and we or, or a fundamental change to the nature of the program. Um, to accommodate a child with disabilities. But we really want to look at that because there's often instances where the initial response is we can't accommodate it, but if we really think through it, they would be able to accommodate it. And I know we've been looking at this particularly with respect to young children in the preschool context. So the right to transportation. School district must provide students with transportation to and from a nonprofit private school that is in the district or within 10 miles of its boundaries. 
So that right to transportation um, does apply. That's in our school code. It applies to children um, who may have <laughs> children with disabilities and children without disabilities. So uh, that applies. And the IU is responsible for transportation to a service. Um, it has agreed to provide. So that's, again, important with respect to that equitable participation services. So if they've agreed to provide the service, they're responsible for providing transportation to it. So that's very important as well. Um, there's no protection in the school disciplinary uh, context. That's true of children um, who are in a private, who are, pri who are parentally placed in any of these private school settings. So that's important. Um, since there's no duty to provide a free, appropriate public education, a parent cannot use mediation, the hearing system, to challenge a school district's refusal to provide certain services or an IU's refusal to provide services. However, parents can use, again, the hearing process as it relates to the duty to evaluate their child. So that's important. So I think I used before a case study example, if a child is attending a private school that's been a, a, the choice of the parents for the child to go to that school. Um, again, there's no obligation by the private school to meet the special education needs of the child. However, that child um, would be able to receive, uh, to participate in the equitable participation services that might be available through the IU. But again, and I know I did have this come up in another intake that I had, where uh, services have been provided for a child who had a specific learning disability. The child's needs were identified through the evaluation process by the school district. The child was then placed by the parent in a, in a private school. And unfortunately, at the end of the school, towards the end of the school term, they ran out of those equitable participation services dollars. And the tutoring services that the child had received at the private school were no longer available, and the family wanted to know if they could challenge that. And the answer was, unfortunately, that they didn't have grounds to challenge that. Because again, that is just what's available. But it's important to know that that is an option and to make sure that your child is participating in that. Um, so I wanted to mention resources that will be available directly after this call. Uh, basic education circulars, which provide guidance on the implementation of law, regulation, and policy. There's a charter school BEC a cyber charter school back. There's an enrollment Q&A. There are also several resources on homeschooling that walk through what's available to children with special education needs. Um, and so I'm going to include all of those on the website after this call. So I hope that that um, will be helpful for folks. Um, I also wanted to provide my contact information here at the Education Law Center. So that's, a, that's now on your final slide, and um, I would very much look forward to hearing from any of you who um, have dealt with barriers um, with respect to uh, admission and participation in the charter school context or any issues that you're having in other non-traditional settings, including children who may be homeschooled or children who are uh, parentally placed in a private uh, or parochial school. So I hope that this information has been helpful uh, this evening. And I do apologize. I know it was a lot of information. I've been um, actually compared to being like a fire hose of information, so I hope it wasn't too much. Uh, Kathy, are you on the line? I am on the line. Can you all hear me? Thank you, Maura, so much for uh, this wealth of information. There have been a lot of questions coming, and I know that we have, uh, we're have we at our 8.30 time, but I'm wondering if we could take uh, two questions. But before we do, I want everyone to know that aside from the BECs that Maura was talking about that will be available, uh, we will also, uh, for all the participants, email you a copy of the PowerPoint as well as a regulations chart that the Education Law Center, the Institute on Disabilities, and the Peel Center um, put together uh, that really does a side-by-side -side comparison of the laws. I think you'll find this very helpful, as well as these other materials that we've mentioned. They'll be emailed to you as well as be up, and they will also be on our website. Um, and uh, Also, before we get to two questions, if that's all right with folks, um, I want you to uh, please note that your opinions are very important to us. So if you could please uh, let us know what you thought about this webinar and give us some suggestions for future webinars, we would greatly appreciate that. So a couple of questions, Mara, if you don't mind. Um, one of the questions was um, that 
the, how are testing accommodations for the PSSAs handled for cyber schools? Um, they should be handled in the same way as you would for a district school, actually, um, in terms of participating in the PSSAs. That, that is something, uh, the accommodations are something that go into the charter school application that is in the cyber charter application, so it explains um, what's available in terms of accommodations. So it would really be specific to that particular cyber charter, how they're conducting, how they're offering those accommodations. Whether they may say, you know, this is where you need to go um, um, at, to the IU and then accommodations will be provided there. But all of that is actually set forth in their application. And again, the state is the authorizer uh, for uh, cyber charters. So if you have any questions about that, um, you should be able to talk to the, um, you know, uh, special ed uh, director of, at the cyber charter school where your child is attending school, and they should be able to explain to you what accommodations are, how that's being provided. But all of that goes into the cyber charter application, and then that is, and they make sure that those accommodations are in place in order to, uh, actually authorize them to serve as a cyber charter. Great. Thank you so much, Maura. Um, a question from a host, uh, homeschooler um, issue. Is the requirement that homeschooled students be evaluated by the school district a new one in Pennsylvania? This looks like it's from a parent consultant. I've had two different districts tell parents homeschooled students were not entitled to any evaluation or services, that the child had to be enrolled. No, this is not a new, um, that, that's actually not a new issue. It was actually clarified after the 2005 amendment to um, the IDEA. So there was um, new guidance that was issued that talks about this um, in the BEC. But I can um, maybe highlight that and when I provide that for you. But it, it shouldn't, in terms of the, the child find obligation and the duty, that has, has been in the IDEA. It may have been clarified by guidance after uh, the amendment, though. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I know that comments are coming in that this was quite a bit of information that's coming through, and the chat box was just uh, um, very busy throughout the evening. And um, what we will make a promise to do uh, is uh, review some of the questions, make sure that we, um, you know, are able to get back to you perhaps in another form, perhaps in another webinar to address some of the specific issues that people have raised during the chats and we can get that information back to you. So um, thank you all so very much. Again, thank you, Maura, for your time. It was excellent information and I hope to, um, please don't forget to also fill out some of the, um, to go on our website and fill out a, um, a parent, uh, a one-on-one -on -one parent consultation request. We have uh, many people from uh, Pennsylvania's Education for All Coalition, uh, parent consultants who uh, will be able to work with you individually as well. So we'll send you a copy of that. So look for our email um, and we're sending you some information and please go on our website. Thank you all very much. Uh, have a good evening and um, talk to you all hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Good night.